In this video, I'll talk about image acquisition and interpretation of kidney ultrasound. Kidneys span approximately from T12 to L3 vertebral level. To obtain a long axis view of the kidney, the transducer is placed at the junction of the subxiphoid line and anterior axillary line or the posterior axillary line with the probe orientation marker towards patient's head. And from there, the transducer is fanned slightly posteriorly to get kidney into view. We use liver and spleen as the windows to look at kidneys. Right kidney is visualized through the liver and the left kidney is visualized through the spleen. And liver is a big organ as you can see here. So even if you move the probe anteriorly, even more anterior than the anterior axillary line, you should still be able to visualize the kidney. On the other hand, if you move anteriorly on the left side, you encounter bowel gas which obscures the view. This is how the long axis view of the kidney looks like. Kidney is a bean shaped organ. It's well defined because of the presence of capsule. And we are looking at the right kidney through the liver. So liver is on the top of the image and kidney is at the bottom. And the probe orientation marker is towards patient's head. So you know that this part of the image is superior and this part of the image is inferior. Once you find the long axis view of the kidney, you fan the transducer anteroposteriorly so that you visualize the kidney in its entirety so that you don't miss any small lesions. So after the long axis view, you rotate the probe counterclockwise such that the probe orientation marker faces patient's bed on the right side and faces anteriorly on the left side. Then you will get short axis uh, view of the kidney. And here is how transverse view of the kidney looks like um, in, the mid, in the middle part or the hilar part. So in the hilum, you have structures entering and leaving the kidney. So kidney parenchyma appears uh, in C shape. And once you find the transverse view of the kidney, you fan the transducer supero inferiorly to visualize the entire kidney. And you can observe that as we are going towards the poles, the kidney becomes more rounded and in the hilar region, as we saw in the previous slide, it's more C-shaped. And here is the comparison of uh, sonographic image and uh, uh, gross image of the kidney. So kidney is well defined because of the presence of capsule. So it shouldn't be difficult to find and identify the organ. And kidney parenchyma is divided into outer cortex and inner medulla. Medulla is organized into medullary pyramids. And on ultrasound image, the echogenicity of the cortex is usually the same or slightly less than that of liver. So that means cortex of the kidney is either hypoechoic or isoechoic compared to the liver or, or the spleen on the left hand side. And the medullary pyramids are usually anechoic. That means they are, they are black. And it's important to note that in most adult patients, you do not necessarily see a uh, well-defined uh, medullary pyramids, but in children, these pyramids tend to be more prominent. And the collecting system of the kidney is embedded in sinus fat. So in normal state, an undilated collecting system should not be visible. And uh, all you would see is this bright area in the middle of the kidney that is sinus fat. So collecting system is um, visible only when it's dilated. Now, what are the common abnormalities that we look for on kidney ultrasound? So that we don't miss any major lesions or uh, assessments that we have to perform, we devised a checklist called the SECONDS, S-E-C-O-N-D-S. -E the initial S stands for size of the kidney. And we look at two parameters here. Length of the kidney, that is uh, side to side, and parenchymal thickness, which is from outside of the kidney to the tip of the medullary pyramid. Length of the kidney in most adults is approximately around uh, 10 to 12 centimeters and parenchymal thickness ranges from 1.5 to 2 centimeters. In most chronic kidney disease, the size of the kidney reduces uh, except in infiltrative diseases and diabetic nephropathy. And E stands for echogenicity. As mentioned before, the cortex of the kidney is hypoechoic or isoechoic compared to the adjacent liver or the spleen. And cortical echogenicity increases 
um, in both acute kidney injury and also chronic kidney disease. Only when it's combined with the decreased size of the kidney, then you can think about uh, chronic kidney disease. Otherwise, it could just be acute kidney injury such as a bad ATN or even glomerulonephritis. C stands for collecting system. And in this, you are looking for hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis appears as an anechoic, that is black uh, branching area. Um, you will be able to see a dilated renal pelvis and uh, calyces. And you may or may not always uh, see the source of obstruction such as stone. And O stands for outline. It's always important to pay attention to the outline of the kidney and see if there are any interruptions or um, any alteration in the shape of the kidney because most of the kidney masses tend to grow outward. And as you know, most of the kidney masses are found incidentally on imaging. So even if your purpose is to just rule out hydronephrosis, uh, it's important that we don't miss um, any mass. N stands for notable lesions such as cyst and stone. D stands for Doppler. By turning on the color Doppler, you can assess the flow qualitatively and you can see uh, if there are any major arteriovenous malformations. And also, when you are doing advanced uh, focus, you can look at the renal parenchymal vessels and assess how is the flow in those vessels. Um, for example, when you are uh, assessing venous congestion in a patient with cardiorenal syndrome. And the S stands for surrounding. So whenever you are imaging the kidney, you should also pay attention to the surrounding area. Sometimes you will find ascites. You might actually find uh, blood um, in a case of trauma or some extrinsic lesions compressing on the ureter. For example, in the transplanted kidney, you might have some lymphocele uh, compressing the ureter, which in turn leads to hydronephrosis. So coming to some core pathologies that you should know on kidney ultrasound. The first one is hydronephrosis. As mentioned, undilated collecting system is not visible generally because it's encased in sinus fat. And when the collecting system is dilated, the urine goes backwards into the kidney and you can appreciate the shape of the collecting system of the kidney. Here, uh, this is a case of moderate hydronephrosis. You see the pel renal pelvis area is dilated. And as you go inside the kidney, you see this branching uh, area corresponding to calyces. And here is another example of the kidney now uh, with hydronephrosis where all this black area is uh, urine going back into the kidney. And you can qualitatively grade hydronephrosis as mild, moderate or severe. Usually in mild hydronephrosis you see some uh, anechoic area in the middle of the kidney, a slightly dilated renal pelvis. In moderate hydronephrosis the renal pelvis is even more distended and uh, um, the calyceal shape is well visualized. And if you observe these calyces, they appear little convex here where the middle pyramids uh, insert normally. And that gives an appearance of cauliflower. And the severe hydronephrosis, there is more back pressure uh, going into the kidney and the parenchyma becomes relatively thin. And uh, um, you can see that more and more fluid is accumulating inside the kidney. And next pathology is uh, a cyst. Cyst appears as a well-defined anechoic lesion uh, followed by acoustic enhancement. So in this example, here is the liver, this is the kidney, and in the lower pole of the kidney, you have a nice well-defined uh, cyst, and you don't see any internal echogenicities. That means it's a simple cyst. And acoustic enhancement means this area of brightness here. So when the ultrasound beam passes through a uh, cyst, which is an excellent transmitter of the waves, the machine thinks there is a brighter area uh, or brighter structure posterior to that. So sometimes they call it posterior acoustic enhancement or just acoustic enhancement. It's a feature of any anechoic uh, fluid collection, whether it's a cyst or you can see that with urinary bladder or, or even hydronephrosis, uh, if you carefully observe, it gives some acoustic enhancement posterior to it. And here is another nice example of a very large uh, renal cyst which is as big as kidney. So here is the kidney. This is the big um, renal cyst and this is another small renal cyst. The kidney appears a little bright. It's, it's because of the acoustic enhancement coming from such a big cyst. So in this kidney it's hard to um, assess the parenchymal characteristics. And anything that is not simple is a complex cyst which means simple cyst should not contain any echogenicities and if you see some septations or calcifications or, or, or some homogeneous area corresponding to blood inside the cyst, 
all these things uh, make it a complex cyst. So in this example here, you are seeing a well-defined cyst with acoustic enhancement, but also you are seeing some internal septations. And here you probably have some small calcifications and calcifications are like stones, right? So they give some acoustic shadowing. And here is another nice example of a complex cyst. Here is a kidney and in the middle, in the pelvis region, you have a cyst and inside the cyst, you have this thick septum. So these kind of cysts should be followed up with imaging. And without sending to radiology, you can just follow these patients in the nephrology clinic if you perform focus. And uh, uh, the next pathology is stone. So in this kidney here, you are looking at um, uh, this correcting system which is dilated. So this kidney definitely has some hydronephrosis, maybe mild to moderate. And uh, here you also have the possible cause for hydronephrosis. This bright area is a stone. So remember on ultrasound, stones and bones appear bright uh, because they are reflecting most of the ultrasound waves. And for the same reason, because uh, the ultrasound waves are being reflected back, um, you have shadow behind these structures. So both stones and bones give shadowing. That's why rib shadows uh, interfere with imaging also. And uh, uh, let's see a better labeled picture here. So this area in the middle is hydronephrosis and he here you see a stone followed by acoustic shadowing. And here is another nice example of a stone. Here is the kidney and in the lower pole you see a bright area followed by acoustic shadowing. And here is a transverse view of the kidney bright area that is stone followed by acoustic shadowing and on color doppler usually stones give an artifact called twinkle artifact which means the the color doppler mistakes a stone for turbulent flow that's why you see all this mixture of colors uh, wherever there are stones so here you have one stone followed by shadowing here you have another stone followed by shadowing on color doppler you can see all this mixture of colors um, uh, following these two stones and the rougher is the stone surface, the more pronounced uh, is the twinkle artifact. And twinkle artifact is better visualized if you put the focal zone um, at the stone or slightly below that. Focal zone means it's it, it, it's a focus, um, it's, it's the area of the ultrasound beam uh, where it's a narrower. So it can be like an hourglass um, a sign in some ultrasound machines. And here you see this arrow. So this is where uh, the sonographer has set the focal zone. At the level of stone and uh, urinary bladder kidney kidney ultrasound is never complete without scanning the bladder and scanning bladder is very easy you place the probe in the suprapubic area just above the pubic symphysis with the probe orientation marker towards patient's head then you will find the long axis view of the bladder and here is a long axis view of a fully filled bladder it's mo more or less of uh, pear shaped and this thing here is nothing abnormal it's a normal uterus and this image was obtained in a uh, female and in the transverse view just turn the probe uh, rotate the probe uh, counterclockwise and uh, you will encounter a uh, rectangular transverse view of the bladder and this pear shape or rectangular shape it all depends upon how much urine uh, the bladder contains it's not um, and uh, this is how urinary bladder uh, looks like when it's decompressed by a foley catheter so when you put a foley catheter and inflate the balloon the cyst like structure is uh, is the balloon and because the foley is draining the uh, urinary bladder there shouldn't be any urine so you just see some wall of the urinary bladder around the foley catheter sometimes you might see little bit of fluid around it which is fine uh, i mean little bit of urine um, but sometimes your foley catheter is obstructed so in that case you have this balloon in the bladder but the bladder is still uh, completely distended so this is abnormal in this case uh, you should just flush the foley catheter it commonly happens when the patient has hematuria um, either it could be because of a, a traumatic foley insertion or some pre-existing cause and uh, it's important to note that pelvic ascites can also mimic urinary bladder because on ultrasound ascites is anechoic fresh blood is anechoic urine is anechoic so all these things appear black and uh, the bedside bladder scanners typically do not differentiate between uh, any of these structures. They just tell you um, that there is 400 cc of urine. But whether it's urine or ascites, you don't know unless you put the probe yourself in the suprapubic area and see. So this thing actually looks so much like urinary bladder. It's relatively well defined. It's anechoic. Uh, there appear to be some irregularities or echogenicities, which could be because of dirty urine also. 
but when you rotate the probe and try to look at it in the long axis you can see that this is no longer well defined you see these bubble loops uh, entering this uh, area of anechoic fluid so this must be pelvic ascites which is in continuity with the rest of the ascites in the abdominal cavity so um, these are the core pathologies we need to be aware of and this by no means is exhaustive thank you